Yeah, let's put that at the beginning of the board discussion so people don't have to sit through the meeting any longer than they have to. Yep. No. Um, any non candidacy? And actually, since my eyes are not as stellar as they were in my youth. I got you, Jim. Nobody, um, nobody's raising their hand. But... Uh, yeah, if someone just wants to shout out, otherwise, it sounds like we don't have anyone. All right, great. No, wait, okay. There is, there is. Where? Oh, okay. Uh, Kristen. Kristen, Go ahead. yes, okay. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Kristen. Um, uh, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, uh, I'm a, a resident of Montpelier, and I just wanted to express um, uh, my hope that the board will encourage the governor to use the um, the those surplus education funds for education, um, as opposed to um, a, a rebate for homeowners. Um, I mean, I I feel that uh, pitting um, homeowners against school children was probably um, not the best thing to do. And I think if anyone deserves a rebate in this time, it's these kids who have really lost out in education. And um, it, it's a it's a one time opportunity. To, and I would hope that the school board would be the advocates for school children um, because they don't have a voice in our government right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Eva. Eva. Okay. okay. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Eva Zaret. Um, I'm a public health specialist at Central Vermont Medical Center, and I'm here tonight with uh, Dr. Mark Detman. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Detman. I'm an ER doctor um, at CVMC. I've been there for almost 15 years now, and um, I've got a particular focus on <clears throat> alcohol and drug dependence and the treatment of that. Um, I'm part of the coalition that Eva's going to mention to you. Um, and um, we offer 24 seven services to people looking for help with alcohol and drug dependence. Uh, but that's not why I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight because primary prevention is one of our prime motives and primary prevention starts in schools and homes. So let Eva take over. Great, thanks Mark. Let me lower my hand, it's distracting. Um, so like Mark said, we both work for CVMC, but we're also here representing the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition or CVPC, which is an interdisciplinary collaboration of professional organizations and agencies working in the fields of drug and alcohol um, prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery. We also have representation from restorative justice and law enforcement and housing and youth services. So a wide range of folks are at the table in the hospital serves as the backbone member of the coalition. The coalition's mission over the past seven years is to create a harmonized and stigma-free system of care in central Vermont, where there's no wrong door or wrong time to get help for substance use disorders or um, addictions to drug and alcohol, and to prevent the initiation of substance use, like Mark said. Um, the reason that we're here tonight is to let you know about a series of virtual community forums that we're doing across central Vermont. They're organized by supervisory union. So we held our first one last month for central Vermont supervisory union, which is sort of the Northfield orange, um, area. And it was a real success. Um, and our next one is slated for the Montpelier Roxbury school district, um, on March 8th at 6 PM. It was previously in February, right in the middle of uh, February break. So we decided to move it to March. And we're here asking for your help in promoting the event to your school communities, including parents, staff, teachers, administrators, um, and students. Because a lot of what we'll be talking about that night focuses on primary prevention in youth. Um, I just wanna take a minute to tell you a little bit about the forums and then answer any questions you have. So at the forum, we bring a panel of experts from some of our partner organizations to let people know about resources that are available in central Vermont for drug and alcohol related issues. And they're also available for a Q&A. Then we center the conversation around primary prevention in youth and young adults. Um, and we share data that's specific to your region, because even though Vermont is a small state, and even though central Vermont's a relatively small region, 
students really differ from school district to school district or supervisory union to supervisory union. So for example, in one school district, we might be concerned that students have low rates of thinking that vaping is harmful or that their parents think it's bad. While in Montpelier, that's not really what we're concerned about. Here, we're more concerned about some things like higher use rates when compared to the state average for um, drinking alcohol, um, attending school under the influence, being sold illegal drugs on campus, even some cocaine use, um, among other things. So once we sort of set the stage and really focused it um, in this hyper-regional way, we move into the open forum for community members where we as professionals learn about what they see as issues, strengths, opportunities, and primary prevention. Um, And we move into actions that we think that the community could take um, based on our analysis of the data, like I mentioned before. So they're really specific to Montpelier. Um, And we also elicit ideas from the community so that um, these ideas are community born um, and community driven. And at the end of the night, we make sure that folks are connected so they know how to take action um, when the forum is over. So that's a a look at what we're planning on doing. Um, It is going to be virtual. Um, Again, we'd appreciate any support that you can give us in promoting an event like this. It's really important. Students um, and people around Vermont are really struggling with substance use during the pandemic, um, including uh, a lot of co-occurring mental health and substance use issues. Um, So we'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have um, or give you a little more info if if you um, if you need it. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Any other public comment? I'm not seeing any hands. Can I just add, um, Eva, do you have a wish list? Do you have a wish list for this group as to what they might be able to do to help us uh, broadcast this a bit? Other supervisory unions have been able to do things like put an announcement in a school newsletter or put something on a website. Um, These are things that would be really helpful for us, helping us share the event. We have a a Facebook event, helping share that um, on social media can be helpful. Um, And any other avenues that you have for getting information out to parents, staff, and students. So if you have a person that we could reach out to with that information, um, that would be fantastic. Yeah, Eva, Eva and, um, sorry, Dr. Gutman, on, the, um, on this call is Anna Hipko, who's my executive assistant, and she deals with all of our communication. She's also our communications director. So Anna is the best person to reach out to with those kind of things. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, can I just add that it would be great if you could email, I mean, my email address is on the website, Emma Bay Hansen, but um, we have access to some face groups and stuff that um, Anna doesn't. Anna does a great job with promoting events. We can share what Anna shares, but it might be nice to share a direct link to the event. If you could, if you could include that on that email, that would be great. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and again, if you go to the uh, like the if you go to the MRPS website, there's a section for the board that has everybody's email on the board. Amanda? Yeah, I just want to thank you for your work and thank you for coming here to bring this information. And uh, we will make sure to share it also with the parents groups who are uh, also disseminate this information. So on the MRPS website, there's a MRPS. Well, Emma will send you the link to join it. <laughs> thank you for coming. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks. Yeah, no, thank you. Very informative. Um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda, which includes minutes of the policy committee meetings, superintendent evaluation committee meetings, equity committee meetings, school board meetings, and warrants and accounts payable, acknowledging the receipt of the 21 audit. Superintendent's report, draft agenda for February 16, approving policy D7, special ed, co-curricular contract. I have a question about an item on there. So I'm not sure if that's to make a motion with one item pulled. It's a really quick question. Yeah. On the co-curricular contract, it looked like something that we'd already created a position for. I just wondered why that was separate from the theater and 
uh was it's, a, it's a, sorry it's for a choreography. a choreography that was not part of the position okay that we uh, created for uh, thank you and i still, still like i still need a second i'll second uh, um any further discussion other in addition to jill's question okay right, great uh all those in favor aye aye any opposed Um, so as I said earlier, we're adding, oh, hi, Kristen, how are you? Um, hey, everybody. Okay. Uh, we are going to add uh, appointments to the visioning committee uh, uh, to the list. We got um, several great candidates, uh, both from the community and from students. Uh, we're also part of the community, but uh, adult community members and student community members. Um, we have, uh, I think, more applicants and there are positions for both. Um, my thought after talking to Nathan is that we um, we choose the number that we slotted for adults um, and give those who we don't choose the option of being an alternate, but they don't get a stipend. Um, and I would like to include all the students if possible and just make them all alternates. Um, and, and also we have to kind of deal with the stipend. I think we only have stipend for people on the committee, but um, my inclination is to you know, try to give all the students some opportunity to be involved. We got you know, a great slate uh, and we can expand the number as well. Um, uh, but we can also uh, we uh, can and I think should go into executive session to make those choices just so we can have discussion off camera. Um, but um, let's open the board discussion with um, that item and uh, with the opportunity for anyone who submitted a, a letter of interest uh, who also might want to say some words to um this is your opportunity to speak if you want to again uh we did not require it and um uh, and and there's no uh no need to and we will you know consider your your application um uh, without any prejudice if you if you do not yeah so please either please use the raise hand function and if you can't use the raise hand function turn your camera on and physically raise your hand Excellent. I don't see any either. Um, just question for the board in terms of do we want to do this selection now and then come back to the discussion about our meeting with legislators and some follow up there? Or do you want to wait a little later for executive session? I think in this room, we could probably turn the camera off and ask people to leave and turn it to the executive session room. It seems like we have a couple of people who are listening on for that legislative piece. Okay. Uh, I don't, I can't tell who's in attendance and we can only see a list of four people in our view. So if there's a bunch of candidates who are also on, then I'm not sure if there are. I don't know if there are. Okay, let's have our board discussion and then go into executive session. Um, just so people who are interested can, can hear. Um, yeah, so at our last board meeting, we met with, with legislators. Um, they brought up, I think, some great issues. Uh, I know there was a expressed desire to continue the discussion around the Ed fund surplus. Um, there are also some uh, desire to have further um discussion around equity i know that was not mentioned on the agenda um i've communicated with both amanda emma and i think emma you're going to reach out to um it's called the equity the, policy uh, committee the coalition for vermont student equity okay they um have somebody lined up to come speak at our meeting on the 16th, 16th. okay so we'll be hearing more about the, that 16th also as you noted there are several 
boards um, that have supported, I think, the yeah, proposal like, of- There's about 25 school districts. And so this is about the people waiting, the, yeah, um, yeah. the waiting proposals that are in the legislature right now under consideration. Yeah. And so after the legislators presented to us at the last meeting, I felt like I was not <laughs> understanding all of the options that were had been presented and that were going to be up for a vote. So I wanted to understand those options a little bit better. And once I did my research, um, I sort of realized, I think there's an opportunity for us as a school district uh, to be timely in our support of one of those proposals. And it does seem like they're, you know, the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity has done a lot of work. They've been doing it for years, um, advocating for what will be the most equitable for the most students in the state of Vermont. And, you know, we heard, we heard the reference to winners and losers during our legislative presentation. And Amanda um, brought up that maybe that's not the best way to look at it. And I feel like a district like Montpelier is in a particularly well-poised spot to sort of make a statement because a lot of people um, rightly or wrongly would perceive us as losers <laughs> in some of these scenarios that are being presented. And I don't see it that way personally. And um, I think that as a district, it would be power, power, as a school board, it would be powerful for us to sort of stand up for what's the most equitable for the most kids in Vermont versus what's gonna be best for our, our taxpayers you know, in Montpelier. Um, so I see it as an opportunity to sort of stand with doing what's right for the most people in Vermont versus doing, you know, seeing it as a sort of winner and loser situation. Um, so I'd like us all to sort of delve into the materials a little bit more and understand the options that are on the table. And then if we see it as being you know, something that we all can agree to, I think it would be great for us to join the coalition as a school board. There's, there's um, 25 school districts, um, school boards that are, or school districts that are signed on. And so we could join that group of, of folks. Okay. The board should also know I was asked to testify on this on Friday. So I will be testifying to the legislature on Friday. They're interested in us because of our um, not small, but not large EL population. Right. And the influence and just our opinion on the whole thing. So Grant and I have been working on that testimony. May I ask what your position is? My position is they're going to, they're going to change the, 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 um, way equalized people is, is handled. So it's not, to me, it's not a winner or a loser. It's just how, how it happens. Um, Either of the suggestions are a significant tax increase on our and on our um, citizens, and so I think what Grant and I came down. And I don't want to speak for Grant, but is we hope that they do a transition period, obviously, yeah. so we can you know do this in a gradual way and don't get hit by a. I think I saw it was like three million dollar additional tax burden with either model. It's a three million plus, so it's significant. So they could do that over time. I personally, and Grant, I think would agree with me, the grant model, um, in all honesty, the Agency of Education does a really good job of making those incredibly burdensome for schools, and it could very well create a siloed system, much like special education has in the past. So I am not a huge fan of adding any more grants, grants that the AOE runs. <laughs> um, because honestly, too, if it's an additional burden more so than it already is. I don't think the taxpayers will like us wanting to add grant managers <laughs> onto our onto our, the tax burden as well. So I'm not necessarily I'm not a fan of the grant idea. Um, as Grant said, the equalized people piece is very complex, but it's what we do now to make budgets. So it's a known entity. Um, so let's make let's get that right. Would be my opinion on it. Um, and and they, the legislator needs to know that, you know, because of um, Montpelier's beautiful welcoming of Afghan refugee families, uh, we have 12 new English learners coming into our, who are in our schools, and they weren't here on October 1 for that count. And so 
Um, and that's a significant impact on our, on our system. So, you know, I'm, I want to give them the realities of what we have. In addition to that, and I'll, then I'll stop, this school in particular is influenced by this conversation because it's a school of below 40 pupils. And um, that has some impact on us and our budgeting and how we think about our budgeting and whether we can sustain a small school like this. So, so you know, there's some suggestions in some of these conversations to almost incentivize schools to continue in this way, but staffing for a school like this is incredibly hard. So it's there, there are some realities that I think need to be put on the table in front of the legislators. Grant, did I capture everything that we were talking about? Today? Yeah, I think so. I was confused by it because I, I saw this education fund surplus in it. So yeah, that's different. different. Yeah. yeah. So what we're talking about is equal as pupil calculations, which will change the, the education study, yeah. funding formula, which yeah. is a different thing. I thought we were talking about like that magical $90 million and how we're going to- We're going to talk about that next, but the equal as um, pupil came up and yeah. you know. So, so yeah, I think it's unfortunate they use the term winners and losers. What it really means, what they really should be saying is, there are districts that are going to gain pupils and those that are going to lose pupils based on a calculation. It's winners and losers is a horrible term to use because it, it, it just connotes so many other things. But, but yeah, I think the free and reduced calculation yeah. is going to be probably even a bigger thing for us than ELL. It'll be um, because like right now, I think the, the weighting factor is like a 0.25. And if they do this, it'll be more like 2.5, which is a huge adjustment. And our free and reduced population percentage is pretty low compared to others. Yeah, we're about 23% across the district. Yeah. So in, in instead of just multiplying by 0.25, it's going to be multiplying by 2.5, which for, for districts with a high FRL percentage, they're going to see a, a huge increase in their equalized pupil count. And we would not see that kind of increase. And all of these things are connected because our free and reduced lunch rate is based on families filling out complicated paperwork, which some do and some don't. But when you don't, when you don't charge for free and reduced lunch, or when you don't charge for lunch, why would they fill out the paperwork? You know, like there's things that are connected here. And so if less people fill out the paperwork for lunch, then the number goes down even more. So it, it, that number is not necessarily a real number of our community. And the, the piece you were talking about with small schools, it's not only, there's like two adjustments that are being projected or, or considered. One is based on the number of kids in a school and the other is based on the population of the town. So whether they're gonna do one of those or both of those, I don't know, but it's, that's, it's a hard thing to think about because in some ways you're like act 46 was trying to consolidate. Now this is kind of going the opposite direction of almost incentivizing the separation. So it's a theoretical challenge to wrap your head around. Um, and the only other thing I would say is what else was in there? Free and reduced we were talking, they, were talk, they were asking about the um, thresholds, the excess, excess spending, spending threshold. And, yeah. Right. They have just a comment on that, which was just like define them better and get rid of the excess spending, deal with it in weights. And then the what was the other one that they're talking about that they haven't defined yet? So it's the floor. Well, I think what they were debating is whether they should legislate a, a floor for education spending per pupil. Like a district can't come in at less than 12,000 in problem, education. Right? Yes. Yes. It it is. Is. It yeah. In Franklin some, County, it okay. is. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I don't, I don't know that, that, I, th I think that's a, a kind of a dangerous road to go down to di to dictate a minimum amount because for, for example, some districts don't have the ability to carry over surpluses. So if they have a big surplus one year, they have to budget that as a revenue in the following year. And if they do that, all of a sudden their spending per pupil could be really low, but if there's a legislative limit then they would have to artificially increase to, you know, it, it, it's a little scary because of some of the scenarios that you can see. Yeah. And, and is, is the thinking behind that to make sure that if mm -hmm. there's a redistribution, it's spent rather than yes. a district coming and saying, okay, we'll just spend the same as we spent last year, but, you know, reduce our yes. tax base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are several superintendents yeah. who are very concerned about that exact fact. Amada, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is uh, 
I always think that it seems hard now, but like this is the long term plan for students in Vermont, right? And and I think if we are serious about you know having an equity policy that we are caring about the student, that that is what drives us, just like the volume. And I think uh, the EL, um, you know, talking about the EL participation, for example, and our increase. These are things that you know we can plan. Also, like these are things that I've been pushing for, right? More translation, more EL, you know, that that are just in line with goals of districts that care about these populations. And um, I think that the the hybrid model that the code study is proposing, which you know will allow for some some districts to say, well, you know, I prefer a grant than this hybrid model right now. I think that will give that flexibility. And I think uh, with the surplus of money and all these conversations, this is the perfect time for Vermont to move towards an equity platform. So I would like to see it like, I mean, I would like to have this conversation more in depth because I think it is a value system that, you know, like we need to be able to say as a school board and make that position. Um, I think that's important. Um, that was I have, a, first. I have a couple quick questions and sorry everybody I was late. Um I just wrote the agenda. I didn't see the Roxbury part. <laughs> um so this is I, I have to admit in the past year, roughly year, I haven't followed this as closely. I followed it really closely when it was first coming out and read the waiting study, and I thought that was great work. It flagged a lot of really important issues with um inequities and how we fund schools. In Vermont, and like the devils in the details, I, I feel like it spotlighted where that devil was, if you will. I was surprised because I, I I went after last week, similar to Emma. I I took some time and looked at the task force report, and I didn't I didn't take a ton of time. I just looked at like the highlights, the recommendations, things like that. You might have talked about this, so I apologize. But I noticed that ELL it looks like they're not planning to add an extra weight or any extra money for ELL. Is that accurate? That's the first proposal that's on the table. Okay. They're still discussing it, yeah. in my understanding. They're trying to figure out what to do. Okay, because that was going to be my, that was, that was like. That decision the has not that. been made yet. Okay, because it, it, I was really surprised to see that. Um, and I found that to be very concerning just on a statewide level that it didn't appear that from, from my quick review of this, that there was uh, an added value for those those students where there's clearly additional need and additional resources. Um, so that was a concern I had with what I saw from this task force proposal. And then my second question is, I I don't know if you have any insight into this, Libby. Um, I've asked a, about this a little bit. I have not, again, I haven't been paying close attention to this, but it is, it's, it's in Senate finance right now. And something that uh, Senator Cummings repeatedly said is we're just learning about this. I think she said we're like in kindergarten on this stuff. I realize that's an analogy, but do we think that this is actually going to pass this year? Yes. That's what I'm that's what I'm wondering. Okay. Yes. I would be surprised if it didn't. Hello. Um so I mean, I I don't feel like I'm an authority enough to to speak on it, and that's why I'm really glad that somebody is going to be coming to speak at our next meeting. Um, but just when I when I read through the materials and when I had a conversation with a friend of mine who is close to the issue, um, the hybrid model that the coalition is proposing sort of is the best of both worlds in a way where they do equalize, they do. Um, change the weighting across the board and include ELL, but then there's this special category of, I think they are referred to as low incidence schools. Is that right? There's, okay. So there's, and that would, and I think Montpelier falls into that category or there's a good chance that Montpelier would fall into that category. And then the grants would come into play. So, and it's, you know, it all makes my head spin a little bit. Um, but I'm glad we're going to be able to talk about it more when I when I hear the conversation in in from Grant's brain, <laughs> it's very heady and all about like budget and math. And I do want to sort of like steer the conversation um, towards our, our diversity, equity and inclusion policy 
and really ask ourselves as a board and as a district, you know, if these are our values as a community to stand up for what's equitable for the most people and not just what's the best for our individual school district. And, and who knows, maybe it will be the best for our individual school district. But sometimes what's best for Montpelier School District isn't best for Winooski, you know, and this type of legislation is, is not looking at individual school districts, it's looking at the whole state and sort of what's best for the most kids. And so that's where I would like to sort of steer the conversation more towards um, what our values are as a community and sort of which one of these proposals is best in line with, with our values. Yeah, no, we can continue that conversation yep. next week or two weeks from now. Would, would it make sense to invite Senate, Senator Perchlick back for, for that meeting to ask him questions related to this? He is the senator and he did serve on this task force and he is on the, I'm just wondering. No. I, I don't, or in my opinion, I don't think so. I think the coalition is very separate conversation than the task force itself. Okay. And that there are, there are some difference. The task force was not, some of those models but, didn't, was not part of the recommendations of the task force. It happened after they had already recommended, even though there was a lot of advocacy to change some of that. I'm talking specifically about the ELL categorization, like that, that piece of the pupil uh, waiting. So th that was not the recommendation of the task force. And then the legislators asked to weigh in and that was like a follow-up report and that's the conversation that happened with all this proposal. So I mean the task force report. So I'm just saying that I think one step at a time here from the college is really doing the work uh who represent some of these the school boards, the school the school districts that have a high L ELL population. Um and some of them are of those districts that voted on our um, wealthy kids, now like all of them are represented. And I, so I haven't been part of this coalition just to be transparent um, because I didn't have time to put it in my brain. I was like, I cannot dedicate some time into that. I've been getting their emails, but I just like, there's like, keep asking somebody from this district to be, to receive, like to, to look in this because I really couldn't. So, um, figure it out in my brain. And then, so it was, I think the Colby report was very transparent and clear for me after the task force report. And so I have been listening to a lot of the uh, public comments from Senator Ruth Harley um, of all the reports that they have given and feedback that they've gotten. So a lot of the questions. What's the timeline on this thing? The whole thing? I don't know. I know they're meeting on it regularly. They tried to have, they asked very specific superintendents to come today, actually, to testify. And like, none of us could. <laughs> and then they moved it to Friday. So we, I mean, they're, it, it seems like they're, they're moving. Yeah, it sounds to me also like it's moving pretty quickly and that. You know, if we as a board want to be vocal to influence anything, that the time is sort of better happen quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're yeah. looking at the two weeks from now to get the coalition to, to come in, but at the same time, they're moving ahead. I, I was just trying to get gauge. Uh, yeah, and the lawmakers are... typically their their sort of calendar, their mental calendar is they have this thing called crossover. I think this yeah. week it's probably the week before town meeting because they're actually off that whole week. So they, I think they typically try to sort of get things from one side of the body to the other, or at least get it like solidified. So this doesn't have a bill number yet. I think we figured out today, but that doesn't mean anything because clearly yeah. there's like this momentum happening that like in the next couple of weeks, it's going to gel around. It's probably going to be a committee bill, I have a feeling. And then it will have to go to and the, the, the house. The house and then they'll probably before that crossover date. And it seemed like from what our legislators were saying last week is the reason why it's in the Senate is because there are um that th there are it, it impacts different uh districts differently within each senator's district 
Whereas for the House members, they may end up advocating for one versus another. So what I, what I gathered from what they were saying last week, and this is just what, what I interpreted from what they said, is it seems like they're taking that strategy because the senators sit at a higher yeah. level and geographic, they cover a larger geographic area. Mm -hmm. So to try and avoid some of the like jockeying that might occur. District level. Yeah, thinking about it a little more broadly. But I'm very interested to see what happens with this. How is how is enrollment in SNAP currently determined? Is it also percentage of federal poverty level? I'm pretty certain. But is it something that that a family has to apply for, or yeah, yeah. Unless there, what's the um, the direct certifications? If, if if a family applies through some direct certification, we can accept that. I'm not here with that. Yeah, it's if your uh, gross household income is equal to or less than 185% of the federal poverty level, um, or you have children and get the um, Vermont, Vermont CITC or the income tax credit. Are there members of this board that or Libby that have objections to the approach of the, <clears throat> the coalition's recommendation? I don't feel that I can make it. Can't I haven't had that opinion yet. There's happens. still so much okay. to absorb. Yeah, I don't feel I fully understand it either. Um, I mean, I'm definitely supportive of the concept. Concept. I mean, I do. I do have a little bit of a fear that if we make our community more expensive, we're going to make it more elite. Um, and you know, are there proposals to deal with that? So, you know, Montpelier is already expensive already, and it's one of the reasons that, you know, we have a population that's relatively privileged. If we become a more expensive community to live in because we have higher tax rates, that I think has probably the effect of making our community even more exclusive. So I, I would like to see, you know, how that's dealt with. Well, that question is like, how does, uh, again, system values, right? Like, yeah. They are the, we invest, let's say, I'm just, we invest in this and then we look at other things that need to be cut to lower that rate, right? Like, it's not like, this is the only thing that's going to increase our tax rate. This is why budgeting exists, and this is why you look at your whole picture. Like, again, in the system of value about the students and like how we uphold it, that, yeah. that conversation. I think if I may just add on, I appreciate the question because, yeah, I'm feeling like we found some, feel like we need to have some thoughts about the five different versions of this that are being discussed in the committees each day. But I, I do want to make sure that whatever the weights are based on are. are objective and not subjective. So I do get worried if they're based on things that we can't quantify, you know, if, if we can't actually capture the actual need of our community in a number that translates to a weight, that's, that's challenging. It'd be, you know, we, we need to be able to demonstrate a real need and not have it based on something that isn't necessarily reflective of the needs of our communities. So if we can't, if we, if we're depending, I'm one of those parents, I get that form and I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm not filling this out. <laughs> that if that's what, that if those are the sort of things that our weight would be based on that requires work or grant applications or that kind of stuff, then the less truly fair it is for the students. It needs to be based on actual information and actual need. I mean, that's a little bit of privilege, right? Being able to say. Exactly. Yeah. That, exactly. So. When my concern is not those that don't need to, but those who can't, but would benefit from it. Yeah, I want to be clear. My point was that yeah. that if we're depending on people having to take an action right. that they may not know about or yeah. may not be able to take, and those are the numbers that our weights are based on, that's not really reflective of what the kids need is all I'm saying. Any of those barriers to that access that are thrown in the way makes it harder to actually get. If it's a grant application and a, a, a particular district doesn't have someone who's capable of you know, jumping through the hoops of a grant application and that leads to the district not getting what they need, that's not, that's not fair. That's all. I wanna be really clear it wasn't about no, just I, forms, I but. Know. 
<laughs> any well, any roadblock that can be put in place of yeah. I mean, showing yeah. the need is not really true access. Are there, if I may ask one more question, sure. may there, might there be ways for some of these, for the board to come up with policies that allow us to assist in uh, families and their need, or is that a possibility, or is everything mandated across the state equally? I think we have, to, we have to find out what the, what the law is going to be first, and then figure out processes. Those are those would be more procedures than policies. That would be my it's my possible. take. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many of the systems are created to stigmatize poverty, and that is what the whole process is to apply for good student release launch, to apply for this service or this service is to be based what, whether or not you have good news. So it's like it's thinking about those barriers more more. To support those families and change that conversation around the stigmatization that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in a very small level, uh, the work of the parents groups in the past couple years of changing that model, that conversation around like we have, you know, just the invitation to things that should be free for people to come in versus like pay five bucks to fundraise, which limits some. Just little things that make start shifting that stigma around poverty and access to it. Well, I look forward to the to their presentation next week. And I think if there's anybody else that we could invite, if people feel that it's somehow um, biased or or you know weighted in one direction or the other, if there was somebody else that we wanted to invite to sort of present multiple perspectives. I'm totally open to that. I was I asked last week about, and it, I I know that the the legislature is joint fiscal office is stretched thin, so I I don't, based on their response and based on the people I know who work there, I don't think we're gonna get anybody from there. But it would be great. And Brad James is probably stretched super thin. He's like he's probably thinking I'm not. There's no way he's mm -hmm. he's thinking he's gonna he's gonna present on this just for our school board. It would be like the do it for make it available. It would be one presentation available to like every school board kind of thing. But I do think it would be helpful. I I want to hear from this coalition. I appreciate what this coalition is trying to accomplish. My general thought is it would be helpful for us to have some additional information that's not from a 501c4 organization. Um, even though you know I support many 501c4 organizations, um, that's kind of irrelevant. A 501c4 organization is advocating for something, and it would be great if we could get kind of a balanced um, overview of the situation, just like something that's like, here are the options on the table. Here's what the legislature is thinking. Here's what was proposed in this study. Here's here, here are the main options that are on the table and here's how they compare with each other and here's how they impact these different populations. We've had that in the past. I, in an ideal world, that's how democracy would function. We'd have that information and would make a decision based on that information. Unfortunately, I'm not certain that that information is out there right now. You know, with the Superintendents Association, the SBA, I haven't seen them put anything together on this. Uh, no, the Superintendents Association is just responding to requests to testify, and it is based on money when we're testifying. You know, it's based on finance, how things influence you financially. Um, that's what they're asking us to testify on. They were very specific. And the reason why they're asking me to testify versus U32's superintendent, you know, <laughs> it's because of our specific numbers and our specific budgetary needs. So. I yeah, did. so if you come up with anyone, I would say invite them to the meeting. I, you know? I don't know if I, Andrew Stein, will come up with anyone. But <laughs> <laughs> if anybody else here does, I'm not really, yeah. I think it's important for the board to be clear about what your outcome is as well, because the this is the legislature's job to, yeah. to decide on what's going to happen. Um, and this board may be able to advocate for a position. Um, but that's 
that would be what the board is doing. Yeah. Right. Is 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 not simple advocacy, but that's that's what it is. They're not. There is no vote to be had here for the board other than do we advocate for a certain position or not. Well, well I think the request though is that my understanding though, Emma, what you're asking for and Amanda, what you're asking for, correct, is that we join this organization, correct? That we join that we put our support behind their recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Which would be yeah. advocacy. Yeah. yeah. And um and uh, from what I've heard, there's a possibility of one or two senators in our county being um you know, deciding votes. So yeah, two, I think it would be very, two I think, of them are very, very critical. So I think we are in a unique position as a school district that is seen as privileged, as a school district who's seen as a potential loser and a, and a district that's in, um, in, you know, in the constituency of a couple of very prominent senators on this issue. So I think we're in a unique position to potentially make our voice heard. If you look at the list of school districts, I think it's very telling the school districts that have already signed on to support this proposal. They tend to be more rural, lower income, more um, diversity districts. And so, um, you know, just my gut feeling is like this is, could be an opportunity for us to stand in support of those other school districts who are really struggling. So I see it as an opportunity um, for us to stand firm in our values around equity. And, um, you know, if I, I'm totally open to being like educated, I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on the issue. I would love for more people to come and talk to me. I've only, I'm only basing it on the research that I've done so far. And, and I felt pretty strongly based on the research I did and who I was speaking to. But um, but if there's more input, I would love to hear it. You know. Yeah, I'd just like an overview for the board. That's where I, I that's what I was asking the legislators last week is if there was somebody who could. Yeah, I think you're getting you the report. Yeah. The Senator Hardy's report and YouTube is it's super and she's testifying every committee in the past month oh, really? about the the task force. I would just say that in line with Emma's idea like we need to be informed that for me the, the conversation is not just about like here's equity but like how, how it shows up in our district you know and like okay like what does it mean and then you're gonna you can make a decision um because I think it's important I think that's what I kept asking is like I don't really understand how the pupil waiting will impact that I still don't know that I still don't have those senses of fi financial so I could, I, I want to be informed about that, like that piece, like what does it mean? Like what does it actually mean on the ground for some, someone that doesn't have the financial background to understand what the impact is? Like what does it look like? What are those scenarios? And so I think that's how we can get there, right? Like being able to actually know how it can. I want to be mindful of the agenda. Yep. And I feel like we have this on the agenda yeah. at our next meeting. No, absolutely. Let's no. I was just gonna I just wanna stifle what was a good conversation. I think another yeah. conversation. Um so let's talk about the education fund surplus. I think this might be an easier conversation. I'm certainly in support of reinvesting that in our schools. Um I'd but I'll open it up to the, the floor. I think, you know, given that you know Burlington is in filings and we've <laughs> we've got a you know hundred year old uh middle school that certainly could use a little TLC and uh um, um, the PCB law yeah, is the PC, significant. The PCB law we have you know we've certainly heard a lot about lead throughout you know Vermont. It seems like there's a lot of good we could do to um invest in our kids and invest in our infrastructure with 90 million dollars other than have a gimmick uh, for Phil Scott. I have a question yes. on that. Um, when we talk about reinvestment, and uh, maybe this is too early, but are there going to be any restrictions? Are there going to be any guidance around what we could do with it, what we can't do with it? Are, are we deciding who's? We're not deciding. Yeah, so the, the governor and the legislature will be deciding it. In terms of if it if it's decided that it if it was decided that it's going to be reinvestment, would the governor be kind of 
be investing in schools across the Vermont or in the kids? How, well, what how his proposal work? is in his budget address was to to, to give it back. But I, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of flipping that. If it was decided that it's going to be reinvesting uh, or reinvestment of funds, mm -hmm. how would that? Do we have any idea how that would work? How that money would come? Well, the legislature would decide, I believe, they have the budgetary power. Theoretically, it would lead to the following year some kind of adjustment to so that spending could be a certain way, but the tax rates wouldn't change. But I don't think that's really what's going on. I don't think that's how they how they would plan it. I mean, if I when I look at my crystal ball, that B, that PCB law is significant and will have direct will have way more people in Macy's, you know, as a result of Burlington as any indicator of that. Could you give us like a Twitter version of what the PCB law is? It's it's the polychloral whatever contamination in school buildings sure yeah so, got probably it. whatever yeah <laughs> yeah we got our environmental yeah. lawyer so right it's here. a requirement for testing and then theoretically yeah. if the testing comes a certain way there's there's a requirement for testing but there is no and for remediation but there's no budget to remediate yeah, and remediation we, can be extremely expensive. as we've learned from the burlington example mm -hmm. it it could potentially mean new schools across vermont yeah. um which are let's face it expensive right so that is significant. Um, I've talked to the board on numerous occasions about the need to increase capacity across the state, particularly in central Vermont, for mental health support to schools. We cannot solve the mental health crisis that we see right now. Schools cannot do it without without outside agencies. And so, if you're gonna if you're gonna put it anywhere, <laughs> put it in community mental health organizations to increase the capacity there. Uh, other things I think about is that we will have a significant teacher shortage and administrator shortage coming up very quickly. And so how do we invest in teachers to get them to come to the state who want to be a teacher? Cutting pensions is not a good option for that. So that's another piece of it. Um, moving back to the equity conversation, how do we invest in Vermont so that we diversify our communities more? Because schools can't solve that either by ourselves. So how do we how do we think about that because that's what's good for kids so there's some things i'm thinking about with with an ed surplus fund um that doesn't have to do with myself and the taxpayer getting a 250 dollars check in the mail and those are all well over 90 million bucks oh i know i know they <laughs> yes. are i know they are so how do you yeah but what you i yeah yeah i mean I, yeah. revenue pcb alone if it's uh be way more than 90 million yeah if, if, if it's a you know pervasive problem if it was important enough to pass a law then you need to pass something for yeah, it's a nasty, it's a nasty well. yeah, yeah exactly Emma. um you know this idea i don't actually know the the proposal that's on the table it's it's to give individual families sort of a a, a rebate a gift that's my understanding yeah. okay and um, so something that Governor Scott said many months ago when we were sort of in the depths of the pandemic, the early stages, early stages and depths, if that's a possible thing, um, he said something to the effect of, you know, they were about to get a whole bunch of federal money. And he said something like, you know, I want to be able to look back on the way that we spent this money and feel like we made a lasting impact and remember what we spent the money on. And look back and be able to say, you know, wasn't that a great use of money? Look at what it did for us. And I don't think individual family rebates, you know, at the amount of money that we're talking, though I'm sure it would, you know, make an impact on a lot of individual families. I would much rather see the money be spent on something that makes like a broader impact for more people and is more lasting in the memory of Vermonters. So I will echo the sentiments of um, the person who spoke at public comment and definitely am in, in support of us advocating publicly for, um, for us to reinvest that money rather than give individuals a tax rebate. Right. Just one other thought is that there is a certain amount of surplus that is expected to be in the budget because of the fact that the ed fund health could be really bad and if something could turn sideways on you and if you don't have that surplus to tap into 
then like this year we had that big increase in the dollar yield. You can see a big drop in the dollar yield and tax rates can go through the roof, but having some surplus there so the tax commissioner could recommend using some of that to help control tax rates is good. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an all or nothing. I think the advocate, the advocate um, position might be just don't give it all back and either reinvest, which might take some time to think about how, and also to leave some of it in there just as a control. Just like I mean, so. coming from the guy who has led this board and the district to have a very healthy capital plan and fund balance, right? It's like we've we've steered the ship to a place where yes, we are saving money and we're we're having surplus, but we're saving that surplus and then we're reinvesting it. And I think that's been a very great strategy that has helped um, the condition of our schools and helped us through the pandemic and in a lot of ways. So I, I think we should stick with that um, philosophy. With, with Grant's philosophy. Well, to, to be, oh my to, gosh, to, he's standing there. To, to be clear, the, the, the <laughs> general amount of fund balance that we had that helped with that is pretty much the statutory amount that's required in the ed fund as a reserve fund for the exact type of crisis that we found ourselves in. And we actually drew all of that down plus some um, as an as as a state um during like what it was late it was mid 2020. That was crazy. It, um, but then because of all of the federal federal money, what that did was huge for on so many levels. It kept people spending money, which kept sales and use tax up, which was huge for the ad fund. Like sales and use tax revenue, all of it goes to the ad fund. And that was really, really big. But also all of the federal dollars that this district and many other districts got. So. Yeah, I think the difference being what Emma was saying, though, is that before we knew the federal money was coming, there was not a moment where I, as a superintendent, needed to worry that we couldn't do yeah. something for our community totally. that was needed, you know? And even now, we need KN95 masks, Deb, go order them. You know, right. like it's not a question for us because of our healthy fund balance, which is yeah. due to Grant's beautiful financial work. But um, that that's not the same in every district, no. you know, across the state. No. Um, and Amanda. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the staffing questions and I'm thinking about the lack of people that are able to, to serve in our community mental health agencies. And I'm wondering about scholarships and <clears throat> educational programs, whether they be at the college level or even at a tech center level that will prepare people to assist. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but $45 million to help boost programs in the tech center that can get kids in, as individual assistants into schools, starting their careers, <clears throat> and um, pro, you know whether it's maybe it's a two-year associate program that gets somebody uh, into a situation where they can go work in, at our community mental health agencies that agencies pay really poorly, that no, retent, no ability to retain um, right. the need is, it's just ballooning and it's and even for substance use problems that's ballooning during this this pandemic situation the need you know um so that's i'm curious of, of what what are the sort of minimal educational achievements that need that people need to get so that they can support the schools not necessarily as a full teacher but quicker you know mm -hmm. Um, and uh, potentially have a job with a community mental health agency that allows them to get into the schools and be a partnership. Um, one of the problems is DCF is over here, corrections is over here, education, the Department of Education is over here, uh, economic services is, is a different group, and they're all attempting to play a role in supporting people that are, have great needs, but they have different buckets that their money is coming from. They can't coordinate, they can't work together. <laughs> if they could work together and it costs us $45 million, that could potentially have a lasting benefit for the state. Um, 
just to coordinate agencies and their ability to respond to some of these problems. Those are some thoughts that I've had about how to reinvest that money to support the community. All right. Um, in terms of, oh, I'm out of time. But, you know, I, I think there is a conversation around what are the themes that are across districts, right? Like, which, you know, I, I can make a list of the things that impact us, that impact other districts as well. There's like bullying, hazing, harassment, mental health systems that are flow, restorative justice systems that are flow, that leads to corrections and leads to policing. Um, the lack of summer camps that support students who are behind, um, literacy issues around testing and all of that, curriculum development, retention of BIPOC teachers, because I think that a lot of the conversations around, let's diversify, but we're losing BIPOC teachers because the culture in the district are not good. I just, we just had three BIPOC teachers quit in the last week because the culture is so horrendous for them. So I think not in the district, but to be clear, not here. <laughs> not here. But um, so I think that like the, this, this, there's a system shift that needs to happen around like the piecemeal approaches to the change that we need to make. There's $95 million in one of the affinity spaces. Somebody had a great idea of hiring for the district two people that can evaluate the mental health system of our community. Like who's there? How do we join the system together? How do we support the school as a community-driven thing? You hire someone to do the system thinking, collaborate with all the groups that are in existence. A model like that, that can like be replicated in all the other districts where there is a lack of watch to mental health. Like all of the systems, uh, we have really brilliant people in many, Many parts of the state that are working alone. So, how do we like, get them together to bring them? So, I think part like our systems are flawed because they're not connected, because they are disjointed. And we can buy a lot of infrastructure, but to for what so that our students are not in a safe. It's like the work that we need right now is. I think it's like a system shift that we need to do. It's like how to think about how to think about schools, not as just like a school, but as a community place where all these connections happen. And that the job is not just for the school, the job is for all of us in these communities to come together to make up. So I see money and I'm like, here. For startup systems. <laughs> There's great people doing great work, but not everybody has the privilege to know them. I'm surprised I don't see a coalition with that similar kind of coalescing for this topic. It's almost like this is like a really immediate need where there needs to be some sort of an entity and perhaps the school board's association or the principal or superintendent that has the sort of, we can give you those things that, that the education fund desperately should be paying for. I haven't seen that the way that I've seen a coalition with actual concrete ideas from the meeting. And I do worry just based on what I'm seeing in my limited oversight, I'm not seeing the specificity of that. And therefore in, in lieu of that, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, I'm worried about where this is gonna go. Very yeah. unhelpful comment. But. And and to be clear, <laughs> this night, just so everyone is aware, the Ed Fund, there's 5% reserve in there, and there's additional reserve, and then there's addition. This is this unreserved, unallocated $90 million. So it really, and there's a lot, I'm sure there are a lot of legislators that also have ideas for this. So I, I appreciate what Phil's saying because the, our school board isn't going to have much influence over this, but like the VSBA school board speaking as one saying, these are important issues that you could be using this money for. That's that's how you know that'll ring, you know that'll 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 convey the message clear to legislators and the governor and administrators will listen if all the schools are saying, "Hey, I mean, we're 
on board. Maybe. We're maybe on board. Maybe. Maybe. maybe not. <laughs> Better chance than if we're just yeah. thinking as one of like 50 some school districts or now it's less than that, isn't it? But I think there is a chance to have our vote there, you know, to say this is what we see. And then maybe other people will echo. I, I'm in the bullying har harassment and hazing council where just submitted recommendations to the secretary of French who asked, like, what do we do with this one? I was like, oh, here's a list of all the things we need to do. We need you to hire blah, 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 blah. So I think, you know, being able to have groups or school boards that say, here's some of these things, and then we can, you know, we can ask a coalition, this coalition of other school boards to do the same or to like join. So I think if we wanted to advocate, I think there are ways to do it. The school board association has other interests as well, I think. So I think we need to kind of move the conversation along is we obviously want to do something or something that's doable that we can do that will have some sort of impact. Is it a letter just from the board to the governor? Is it reaching out to the school board association to see if there's a coordinated effort we can join? Is it both? I think it's both. Who wants to take the lead on either one of those? I nominate Jim Murphy. <laughs> uh, Jim Murphy has very little time. <laughs> For which one? Either one. I mean, I could reach out to the school board if someone wants to put together some sort of letter. Um, I can just reach out to Sue and see if there's a coordinated effort to get back. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Amanda. And our senators. Thanks, yeah. All right. Um, any any more on this, or is that kind of a good good next step? We don't have to. We don't need to like pass a resolution or anything like that. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think yeah. we'd want to. You know, I think once we have a draft. We'd, we'd want to review it and make sure we're comfortable with it. Okay. Um, and what's and the timeline on on that decision? Do we know? know? On what? Oh, that's going to be that's that's the, that's that's doesn't happen. That's probably going to be like in the big bill. So that's May or June. Okay. So okay. We've got so we've got some time to craft um, the perfect letter. Yeah. But, and, but we want to start reading the narrative. <laughs> You might also, yeah, I'm just thinking, you might, you might want to. Better to the editor? No. <laughs> no, no. I think we start with this assumption. Yeah. Uh, so, next item is. Um, update on the community input from the board's outreach on the SR. Is that you, well, Amanda? Should, so should we move, should we do the executive session for the appointments to the visioning committee? You can do that now if you want to. I'm happy. I'm good with that. What do you want to say? Move it to the end. So then yeah. 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 Pick up the camera. Okay. Yeah. They don't have to wait for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that you, Amanda? On, yeah. Yes. yes, it was my. Oh, on this question, one, too. But, um, so I, uh, I would say that we had three really successful, beautiful uh, affinity spaces with lots of great ideas, which I share with you. I hope that you read them. If you didn't, you should. Um, and then we be share with the administrators. And um, uh, Kristen, me and I met our equity committee with the idea that we still want to do a little more. Uh, we got, we still want to reach out to the um, families who are struggling financially, where you, you to just hear their voice, what, you know, what ideas they have. And so Mia is going to um, develop a flyer where Mia can have uh, a session or two 
Um, we wanted to offer it to you all if you want to have a lunch session. So I can put in a flyer with the Zoom if you like. Meet with the school board and, and give just people more chances. I uh, did develop some some surveys for each of the activity spaces to kind of resend to families who didn't make it. Say, hey, we still have time to weigh in, give your voice, hear the feedback in case you're missing something. I mean, generally, I think kind of like the echo, many of the conversations are echoes of things we've heard here. Special so we had special ed literacy, uh, white off, LGBTQ, and neurodiverse. So we have five affinity spaces. I led the BIPOC, neurodiverse, uh, LGBTQ, and then me, I did the literacy. And then uh, Kristen did a Roxbury little session with the PTO. So, so those are there, and maybe we'll share that with you. And yeah, I mean, in summary, uh, I think it's some of these topics, right, around restorative justice, around curriculum development, like concerns uh, around uh, being able to be seen in terms of the BIPOC LGBTQ community, even the disability folks about how we tell the stigma and all of that, about access to interventions early before, you know, it triggers the law, you know, we can do um, in terms of uh, and it was, you can read it <laughs> and it's there. The question we had for Libby is if you wanted a more formal report, which we could do. I did get from the AOE the dates of the SR3. Um, and so just what we wanted to ask you about that timeline. The application is due in March. May 22nd is what? I got from no, the it's, AOE. March it's March, yeah. Oh, we just had a meeting about it this morning. Okay. Um, for the SR3, I just got that yesterday from the So, what we, so the question to you is what do you need from us and how would you like to incorporate those comments? And if we get more in the next couple of weeks, or do you not want us to get it more? Um, we're at a stage where we need to start making some decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it has to go through a, a public comment period. You know, the plan has to go through a public comment period. So we need, and then, and we need time to actually write the grant. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we're pretty much, if you think about where we are in the school year with February break coming up very quickly, we're pretty much at the point where we need to, we need to put a plan together to present to the community. So. Um, there isn't a whole lot of time left okay. when you think about all of those things. I'm curious how many people were at each. Um, I can I can share. So for the BIPOC, it was like six families. Uh, the lyrics of eleven. No, the uh, I, I, I don't know what the lyrics because me I did that. The neurodiverse about eleven. I have to like look at the numbers, but it was a small number, but pretty representative of the mm -hmm. same conversations that happen in this district. So I am not gonna also try to right. what I'll do is I'll put that Google Doc because anytime it's updated, I know Kristen had to put some things yeah. in from RVS. Anytime it's updated, I'll just put that link into the public plan document that's, that's on the website. And so when anybody updates it, it will just automatically update okay. for the that's public. great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we will continue to try to do it just a few more and then give that Google form so that people um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to actually send it to like the flyer to the groups that you have. You said that you had some listservs. But did you ask Dana to do it? I, I, I'm not sure if I actually did if she was in an email or if it was like this and then I'm not sure. So so maybe we, she can send it still the server with it. I have I have three Google Forms, four Google Forms set up with links to the that specific affinity space so that people can read what was said and add more to, but not in that condensed one. Mm -hmm. And I will take that. So mm -hmm. you can set those three. Is that okay if I send them to Anna? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for Rhonda or questions in the process? Okay. Yeah, no, thank you for doing that. Um, with Amanda and I know Mia's not here and Kristen as well. Um, Kristen, I, sorry, just asking Kristen if I missed something. Did I miss something you said? Sorry, I'm catching bits and pieces. I have oh. an executive assistant in the room with me right now. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I'm on the, so that there's just going to be um, some outreach to families experiencing financial hardship. And I think what we talked about at the meeting is that if there was a way to send that opportunity out, um, like Libby, if you had, I don't know if that kind of data gets collected and there's a way to kind of anonymous, anonymously send that out, like if that was part of, kind of the outreach that you did over the summer, but that there was an interest to figure out if we could get that in front of folks that, you know, it would be relevant for you had an avenue. I did check with Anna to make, to see if she has a, I'm like, she was having internet problems at home, so she may or may not be on, but <laughs> yeah, I have to check with Anna to see if she has a listener for that particular group. I'm not sure if she did or not. Okay. That's pretty FERPA protected information. Yeah, yeah, and we had discussed that too, and just, not, you know, knowing that we, that's a tough, that's, uh, one moment, please. That's a tough label. And so we just want to be really sensitive to that. But because of, you know, that experience that we wanted to be able to hear back from folks and how those circumstances um, could be could be met and could be sort of supported by by what the what the plan includes. And I did have a question for Gail. Um, around the thinking for the SRC funding around, because that came out a lot around the summer program. Mm -hmm. And um, and if that is like a thought right now. We're actually, have, we actually have a lot of money left over from the SR2 line, budget line for summer programming. So that's an SR2, not an SR3. But for the intervention, now for like the summer kind of We haven't talked about intervention. It's not something that's happened before Montpelier Roxbury. I'll tell you, it, there's a lot of research that says it has to be done in a certain way for a certain length of time in order to have any kind of impact on students. Um, I go back and forth if we want our own teachers to do that kind of work. Our own teachers are burnt out and that's their time to relax. So I even- <laughs> Unless they're working a second job. Which exactly, do. which sometimes. Some do, yeah. But, uh, and often that second job is Kind of fun for them, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, or at least they're switching right? gears. Yeah, it's switching gears and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I go back and forth on it. Is there something that we can ask them so that we don't decide? Them? So, I mean, it's not even the so the question. So, two questions. One question is whether it's our teachers. Two question. The second question is like, do we, do we have a program? And then we ask other teachers from our districts to serve our kids who are being really scratch up. So um, just like it, just a question I have around the summer, the summer interventions and, and what's coming. Especially because now all the summer camps are coming up and people are filling them. I think and there's lots kids. of different perspectives on on that piece. And so I'm not sure. Right now it's not dedicated to intervention services. To enrichment opportunities. Six years of high school coming up. Six years of high school. How to catch up before. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of the idea of catch up is, is arbitrary as well. I, can I add something? Because I realized I sent something to Kristen last week, but I wanted to add this on because it's based on a question she asked and it pertains to funding for some things that we've talked about the past couple of weeks. Um, recreational cannabis. Uh, is set to, that market is set to open this year, and 6% of all recreational campus sales are to be used in law um, for after school and summer education programs. And uh, in FY25, once the market has ramped up more, it's forecasted to generate between roughly $4 million and $11 million a year. That's the sales tax component of cannabis sales. I just wanted folks to know that for the first talk about money for after school.
school and summer program over the past few weeks. And I realized I just sent out the first one. I didn't send that one. Yeah, be, for the summer programming, we've never done it before. So, and we're not a 21C district. So the, the challenge is, is that we don't have a position to run summer programming. So that's what, you know, if we got extra money to do mm -hmm. that, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. uh, we have a very limited slate of actors who are working in the summer right now. So Matt Link ran our sports camps last year and he's ready to do so again this year, but you know, he's running sports camps because that's his thing as the athletic director. If we wanna do other things or the board wants us to do other things, then we need to, we, we would need to hire a position to do that. Yeah, and I'd have to look in law. The law says how that money is to be. If there's like some structure, it's it's loose though. It might just be like an AOA, an AOE grant program or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. It was like some bad one. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. To know that money's being well spent. Um, it could potentially in the future. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, um, so now the uh, long awaited finance video update. Anna can take it away. Okay. <laughs> my, my giving them the, okay. <laughs> you were the one who wasn't looking at anybody else, Anna. Everybody looked at you. Yeah, I was looking at my computer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a safe. Uh, <laughs> Same thing to do. Um, all right. Well, um, we have uh, the audit uh, report that I guess we uh, everybody got it or we're getting. Um, um, just to summarize that, and um, just to I guess um, kind of being a conduit from Grant to you guys, um, we've had a very successful audit. Um, the report's been fantastic. Um, the team, Grant and his uh, folks have done a fantastic job. There have not been any corrections, or I don't know the exact language, Grant, but there were no uh, findings. finance no, so findings. findings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were four or five uh, things that that were listed, and Grant went to each one of them, and, and they were we were satisfied with the reasoning and um, what Grant had uh, um, told us. So all in all. Um, just a very successful um, um, art report. Uh, as far as the quarter four final um, 2021 quarter four uh, final uh, report, uh, there were no changes that we needed to make or we made. So it, uh, the budget number, we were 99, is it 96.31%? uh in terms of expenditures and 99.5 percent in terms of uh revenue um we the the surplus was a little more than what we had anticipated uh, which is a, in a way a good thing um, um and there were um various reasons for it but they all uh made sense and then finally moving on to the quarter two 2022 um, numbers. Uh, we are uh, the expenditures are almost in line with what we think. There were a couple of categories which we were we are a little higher than what we thought we would be, and and a couple of them lower. Um, again, I I can go into details, but all within reason and all what we anticipate. Uh, would be uh, similarly revenues. We uh, were expecting about 52, averaging 52.5% um, in terms of overall numbers at this point, and we are at actually at 51.94. So they're very close to where uh, we would like to be. Grant uh, or anybody else, Jill, um, have I missed anything? No, that was well done. And it all is in your it is, it is. It, it is in our packets. So. Yeah, and one of the things of the, the audit is we need to have uh, received the letter. That's what we, we need to acknowledge uh, that we have received that letter and the packet. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it.
So we do need a motion to approve our the, the two financial two, statements. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, any any questions on the presentation before we get to a motion? Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. Kristen, do you have a question? Kristen, do you have a question? Up. Up. No question. All, right. All, right. All set. Great. Thanks. Um, motion to approve the these two separate motions. I can do a log one. Let's do them with two just to be extra, extra careful. Uh, motion to approve the FY21 fourth quarter financial report. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and a motion to approve the FY22 second quarter financial report. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little deja there. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, great. So now we can, uh, we need a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of appointing committee members to the, um, envisioning committee. And I guess a question, can we bring Nathan, do we want to bring Nathan in as a consultant, which I think we're allowed to do. Yeah. I think the purpose yeah. would be to discuss candidates. Yeah. Not to so appoint I, them. I would suggest bringing Nathan in. Yes. Uh, to, yeah, to discuss the appointment of candidates, and then we will come back out of the first motion and appoint candidates. So, um, so do I have a motion for I that purpose? Session to discuss the appointment of candidates. Not to, oh, discuss the appointment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Second. 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 We you move, you make you I, move. I move then to appoint second. Sigrid Olson, uh, no, Melissa Hauser. Hauser, Tina Muncy, Caitlin Brower, and Dottie Guifri as uh, adults community representatives to the visioning committee. Um, Susie Ford and uh, Joe. Carol. Carol as staff slash faculty. Uh, Estherline Carlson, Kale Ellingson, uh, Merrick Modoon, Amira Lewis, Elliot Muller, Emery Richardson, Amelia Woodard, and Carmen Richardson Skinder uh, as student representatives. And Amanda as a board representative. And did you get Joe and? Yeah, yeah all to the visioning committee. I second it. Aye. All those in favor, say aye. Aye, favor, any opposed? Sorry, I was fixing my wife. Um, <laughs> I second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you, everyone.